when you've been through hard things, it can take a lot of time to begin to unravel that and to heal. And healing doesn't stop. It's an ongoing process. Yeah. But to get back to a point where you can go, okay, I can start again. And I don't know what life's going to look like now, but but it, it's it's time to, to venture out into something new. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to episode 119 of the Kameno Voice. Today, I speak with the owner of Kameno Cookies. Please welcome Elise Lean. Hi, I'm Brandon Erickson, and you're listening to the Kameno Voice podcast, where I interview folks around Kameno Island and beyond. If you want to stay up to date on events, businesses, and even hear a little history of this area, Subscribe to this podcast and share with your friends. Thanks for listening. Welcome back to another episode of the Kameno Voice, where we release a new episode every Tuesday. Uh, how, how was your week, guys? Hope your week was good. Um, I, uh, myself and my wife, uh, me and my wife, English is hard for me, guys. Anyways, um, this last week, uh, my wife and I just got back from a... Uh, business conference that we were at, and oh man, had a great time, learned a lot from it, um, and uh, yeah, got back to the hotel room every night, and we're just exhausted, um, so much information downloaded in there, uh, but really, really enjoyed it, um, and actually ties into this episode, um, so one of the things that, that they were talking about at the conference was was having a business that was more than just a business, right? Um, and, and I think we hear this a lot with businesses, corporations and stuff is like, we don't just, we're not just in it for the money. We do this, you know, whatever that is. Um, but really like for us, like here at the marketplace, um, our mission is to bring joy to the Camino Island community through food service and drink. And so for us, it's not, we're not just a bakery and we're not just a, an espresso bar or an ice cream shop or anything. We're, we think we're bringing joy to the Camino Island community. That's our mission. That's what we do by being here. Um, so super, uh, you know, so our mission is more than just the business and just making money. Um, and so I got to speak with Elise on this podcast, uh, and she owns Camino Cookies. And I think she just encompasses this to a T. Um, her business, Kameno Cookies, is she makes cookies. They're beautiful. Uh, they're delicious, too. <laughs> I've gotten to have some now. Um, I bought a box shortly thereafter recording this podcast, and um, they were fantastic. So be sure to check them out. Um, but um, I digress. Um, cookies always get me excited. So, um, But that's not what her business is. That's not why she does what she does. Uh, if you follow her Instagram, uh, at Kameno Cookies, or her Facebook, um, her mission around her business is so much more to that than that. It's, um, it's building from a space of bringing positivity into the world. And, and when you hear her story um, in this episode, you'll realize how much she has to work and like how much that takes from her to put that positivity out there. And she does it so well. So I know you guys are going to enjoy this conversation. Um, so I'll stop talking now. And without further ado, here's my talk with Elise Lean. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Kameno Voice. Today, I'm here with the founder of Kameno Cookies. Welcome to the podcast, Elise Lean. Thank you, Brandon. It's yeah. nice to be here. Awesome. So before we get started, tell us a little bit about Elise. Oh my goodness, where to start? Um, I have been in the Camino Stanwood Island area for about a decade now, or 11 years. Okay. Um, it has been the one place in the Northwest where I would say I really feel at home. <laughs> like I've traveled to different countries and it's been the first place where I just settled in and I really love the atmosphere here and all the people and it's it's been a wonderful thing. <laughs> nice. Very cool. Um, what were all the places that you've traveled? Oh my goodness. I have been to England twice. I've been through Greece, Italy briefly, um, different parts of the U.S., um, Mexico. <laughs> so I've spent numerous weeks in Europe, and that's really where my heart's been for most of my life. I feel European at heart. Yeah. <laughs> I always tell everybody I'm an English girl in the U.S., <laughs> even though I was raised here. Yeah. 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 My, my wife is similar. She's uh, She and um, Emily, actually, who you, you've interacted with yeah um they both were over they went to england um 
uh, Emily was going to school there, but my wife went and visited her uh, at the end of her school. And they spent um, a few weeks or a couple weeks going around England. And yeah. um, they've always been in the, you know, Jane Eyre and uh, Jane Austen and all the different English, like, literature and yeah, the movies classics. and all that <laughs> stuff. I'm the same way. Yeah. So when they went over there, my wife was like, this is every... It, she's like, most places, like, you build up in your mind, like, they're going to they're gonna disappoint in some way. Um, and so she had built it up so big in her mind. And she said when she went there, it was better than she had built it up. And she just like, was like, this just, yeah, like what you said. Yeah, just, oh. I felt the same way. I had so many people from the time I was a teenager go, oh, you won't like it when you go over there at all. And I got there. And as soon as I put my feet on the ground, I was like, this is home. Yeah. Like, it was like I found myself. I'm like, oh, I fit here. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that was, that was my wife. And I was like, um, we can't just move you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not that easy. <laughs> so... Very cool. Um, So where did you grow up then? I've grown up in the Pacific Northwest my whole life. So my family all converged in Linden. I still have relatives Mm. up there. And we moved everywhere down to Lake Stevens, um, Snohomish area, back up to Arlington is where I spent the bulk of my growing up. Okay. But I've always known people out on Camino and Stanwood as well. So I've always just been right here. (laughs) Yeah. Nice. So uh, did your family, like how many... Was your family multi-generational then, then, or did they move up there? My great-grandparents actually had a homestead where the Dairy Queen is in okay. Linden. It used to be their homestead, and their house sat right where that Dairy Queen was. Wow. They built it from scratch. They're still in the cemetery up there. and <laughs> So it's, it's really old history. My parents moved from there when I was small, but we've gone back my whole life. Okay. Nice. Yeah, we, uh, my wife and I lived up in Linden for a short stint. Oh, we did. Time. Um, and yeah, it was... It was fun it was interesting living there um yeah it's a different culture bubble (laughs) it is it's so weird it's like does not it feels like you crossed into a different place yeah it really is its own little 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 spot (laughs) yeah very cool so um where did you guys move after moving from linden oh i think it was like stevens for a number of years Uh, my grandparents were down there they were pastors for years okay and then we moved back to arlington um that way when i was small and i most of my growing up was there okay Nice. How was uh, how was growing up in Arlington for you? You know, it's just typical small town. I think it never really fit me as a person. Okay. <laughs> like I said, Camino, when I finally moved to the Stanwood Camino area, it was like, oh, this fits. I think I just found more, there are more people that have been to a lot of different places that have traveled, especially out on Camino Island. Yeah. And I just really relate to that. More people that experience more global mindset. Yeah. And I really relate to that. And so, yeah, it just took coming here to go, oh, there's... <laughs> More people I can connect with better. Yeah. That's funny. I was actually, so I was just down in Arlington, like main downtown, because I yeah. wanted to go visit yeah. Arlington Hardware. And um, it was funny, like going through that town, like just walking, I, I parked, I got completely turned around and parked way away from Arlington Hardware. Mm-hmm. So I walked down the downtown strip and walking that, it was funny because I was walking down. I'm like, this feels like a town in like almost like the Midwest or something. Like it feels very old. Like yeah. Down, yeah, it does. Small town. Um, everyone I saw is like, you all look like Arlington. Like <laughs> it, you, it you, has its own feel. <laughs> <laughs> so it was great. It was it was like it was really weird though. It was again one of those things where it's like you've entered like a little bubble. Yeah, you, know? you have. It definitely is that way. So many people there are related, a lot of Norwegian roots. And, yeah. 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 No, so that was that was neat. So um okay. So then did you go is that where you went to high school and everything? I was actually homeschooled for most of my schooling. Okay. I did a couple stints in private school and grade school, but um I did better just one on one at home. My mom was really smart, really great teacher. Yeah. <laughs> and so um it gave me the ability to work on my own and work ahead. I graduated mm-hmm. really early. Okay. But I really thrived on that just independence. Yeah. It was just what worked best for me. And I know it's not for everyone, but it allowed me to learn the way that I needed to. Right. Nice. So then um, when once you graduated then, what did you do after that? I immediately started working um, full-time at about 17 because I graduated high school at 16. Okay. Um, and I had, you know, a few different jobs. I worked in customer service. Um, and by the time I was 19, I had already started my first business working mm. for myself. And by the time I was 21, I was working full time from home. Wow. So I was teching electronics and selling computers and cell phones and refurbish things all from home. Okay. And yeah, sourcing things wholesale and selling them all over the world. Wow. <laughs> but that really, that really changed when the market, I don't know if you remember that, the market changed in 2008. Okay. Yeah. And it was such a shift and it, 
it really was a time for technology where things were changing even more quickly and you weren't able to do the same things. And so it was a, it was a change in what you could do. Yeah. Nice. So had you always been uh, like growing up and stuff, were you one that played around with electronics and tried to figure out how to fix them and all that stuff or? You know, I kind of feel like <laughs> I rode my dad's coattails on that. My, I come from a really technology based family. My great grandfather was an inventor. Okay. Um, and my dad started fixing computers. Was I 12 to 14? Okay. And so I was around that and I just, I took to that. I built my first website, I think at I don't know, was I 12? <laughs> okay. And so I just, I was just around that, that kind of atmosphere yeah. and I really took to it. Yeah. And so I, I love knowing how things work. Anything, just thinking about it, take dissecting anything, whether it's technology or, you know, baked goods, how a recipe is. I love taking things apart and really understanding the components yeah. and putting them back together. Okay. Very cool. Um, was that something, uh, as you were doing that, then what, I guess, um, like, I know that that was definitely a time where like, uh, 2007, eight, um, I was actually just trying to think about this when the iPhone 3g came out. Yeah. Cause that was, um, when you talk in the tech world, like that was the pinnacle, that was the moment where people realized this is the future of this computing. Is the future. Yeah. Yep. yep. And I was still, when I was doing that, it was still the flip phone days, okay. <laughs> the little brick phones, you yeah. know, it was early on, it was yeah. very early on. Yeah. And I've, yeah, I've played around with, like, I'm, I'm super into technology where it's going, um, yeah. and all Same. of the aspects around it. Mm -hmm. Um, but where I've gotten, where I'm not strong is on the, the hardware side of actually the soldering, the fixing, the, the component side. Yeah, I get that. I, I would have so much to learn at this point. It's, it's easier for me to go, okay, how do I tech a computer? Something's yeah. broken, just work with the operating system that's there. But yeah, actually pulling it apart, soldering, all that, it's not my forte either. Right. Yeah, I, I got, uh, we had a, I had a 360 that um, got the red ring of death and I tried to fix it. I watched some videos, fixed it, and it was working. I was like, oh, this is cool. Like I, I was able to fix something yeah, on my own. yeah. Um, and so then I was looking into like, well, what, how, you know, maybe I could make a business out of it, start fixing them. Mm -hmm. And then like a month later, my Xbox died again and I tried to fix it the same way and it didn't work. Didn't and I was work. like, maybe I'm not meant to run this type of business. <laughs> it takes a lot. It takes a lot. I grew up with a dad that was forever doing stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it, there's a lot of learning curve with it. Yeah. You got to know if it's for you or not. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So your, your first business then. Was that doing the technology, the, the cell phones and stuff and just repairing them? It was, yeah. Finding ways to bring in items that needed refurbishment. Mm -hmm. It was everything from Apple products, iPods, to cell phones, computers, um, fixing them and then reselling them. Okay. <laughs> but it worked in, we worked with books, jewelry, clothing, a lot of different areas. <laughs> okay. Wow. And was it just you doing these things or did your dad help you with some of um, the stuff? We or? both, we started together and we both had so much on our plates that it, we ended up with two separate businesses. Okay. So it was quite a few years. Yeah. So then, um, after you had done that, then you said you were running that until you were like 21 or on by 21. You oh were, my goodness. Like, 2008. I can't even remember how old I was. <laughs> it's been so long ago. Yeah. Um, so then when you were working full time for yourself, was that just doing the flipping of it was just doing flipping of technology items. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So what happened with that then? You know, it just faded out it, again at that 2008 downfall. And um, that was a point in my life that that went away. And I found myself in a process of reevaluating a lot in a really quiet period in my life. Mm -hmm. And um, our family just kept going through a lot of challenging things. And so it's take, it's honestly taken me this long and starting Camino cookies to really find something where I'm like, yeah, this is going to work and yeah. this is good again. And having another business that I'm really excited about and, and proud to have. Yeah. It's just, it's taken a long, I feel like there's been like 11, 12 year period of my life that was just, it was really quiet and a really time of working through challenging things and mm -hmm. circumstances and to get to now and go, okay, it's time to reboot, you know, in the midst of a COVID period <laughs> hit. <laughs> but you, I, so many of us have reevaluated a lot of things. Yeah. And it kind of seems silly, but it's like, I've heard of others. It's like, okay, oddly enough, now is the time to start another business. In, yeah. In where life just seems to get more challenging, but go, nope, it's time again. And to focus on some positive things and, yeah. and find something forward motion to yeah. look toward. Nice. So... 
<clears throat> once you once that kind of all once the the first business kind of faded and everything, what did you end up doing? Did you just go try and get a job then? I had some odd jobs here and there. I actually nannied <laughs> for okay. quite a while. Um, I moved back to back in with my folks. Um, my story is really tough. I went through. I'm a human trafficking survivor, and I went through some really really hard things growing up. Mm. And it was a period where. By about 2009, I just started to work through that. And it has honestly taken me 10, 11 years to really gain my footing. Yeah. And really, it when you've been through hard things, it can take a lot of time to begin to unravel that and to heal. And healing doesn't stop. It's an ongoing process. Yeah. But to get back to a point where you can go, okay, I can start again. And I don't know what life's going to look like now, but but it, it's it's time to to venture out into something new. Yeah. It, it felt like a lot of years were lost, but the investment was internal. And right. so there were a lot of quiet years. My, my family, my parents especially were just, they really supported me in a time where I wasn't able to work. Right. I was really struggling. Yeah. And, you know, I want people to know that if you're in that place, there's no shame in that. Yeah. And the best thing you can do is, is take care of yourself and what you need. Yeah. So that you can find a spot where you're like, okay, I can thrive again. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I've, um, I've had some people on the podcast that, that work, uh, in, you know, human trafficking awareness yeah. and, yeah. and, um, you know, having daughters myself, um, it's, it's the world we live in that is just, you know, it can be very scary on it that can side. Be very scary. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I'm just the, the, how people are able to push past these things. I mean, I think. Yeah. Um, a lot of us, we go through little things here and there and, and, you know, everyone has their own, everyone is used to what's hard or difficult in perspective of themselves, Mm -hmm. of what they grew up with. Yep. What they know. Um, but people like yourself who have gone through things that are just 99% of us will never understand. Um, and now you have a a business that you're running and (laughs) it's very, very cool. Yeah. Um, it's. I think what I want my life to show people is that no matter where you've been and no matter what you go through, there's always hope. Yeah. It may be difficult, but there's always hope. Yeah. And to keep looking forward. Yeah. And that's in whatever I do, I realize that I have this hunger and this search for beauty and to spread as much happiness and joy and encouragement as I can. And that really comes out of what I've been through because I've seen the worst side of humanity I've seen so many people at their worst Mm -hmm. and I don't ever want to perpetuate that in the world around me. I want to be the exact opposite of what I've been through and, and show others that there is a different side of life. Yeah. There is kindness to be found. Yeah. And that's just my heart (laughs) and everything that I do. Yeah. That's so cool. Um, so as you were, as you've worked through everything and what kind of, um, what was kind of the Kickstarter for deciding, like getting back out there, starting, uh, whether it was jumping back into work or jumping into Commando Cookies? Um, I would, you know, right as COVID hit and the pandemic, everything shut down, I was going through something um, personal. It was really challenging. And that first year was just, 2020 was tough. Mm -hmm. And it was for so many people. And I got to November of 2020 and I went, I'm either going to stop in my tracks and let depression and discouragement win, or I'm going to pick myself up by the bootstraps and go, there's something better in life. Mm -hmm. And I knew that for me personally, I'm like, if it's going to be fulfilling, it can't just be for me. It's got to be to encourage others in the process. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what it was. I honestly didn't know what it was going to be. I, I sat down and went, okay, I'm really creative. I could do this. I could do this. And I looked at a few things and I just felt like I just hit walls and went, nope, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. And I went, well, I originally started Camino Cookies in 2017. Okay. It just didn't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I knew at the time the timing wasn't right. And I went, well, it didn't go anywhere. It didn't work the first time, but nothing else is working either. So maybe, maybe if I just commit again, let's see what happens. Yeah. And for me, it was a leap of faith just to survive really (laughs) to begin with. I'm like, it was a survival thing. I needed something positive in my life. And 
I didn't realize what would happen. Yeah. In the midst of it. Because I honestly expected it to go absolutely nowhere. <laughs> I thought it'd be like so many things in my life where I'm like, it's just going to fail. It's going to dive down and, and just dead end. And I could not believe the responses that I got. Yeah. And how quickly I'd made a full business plan and set goals right out at the get go. Yeah. And they've exceeded them every nice. time. And that surprised me. <laughs> because I just, again, I went, okay, it was just the timing. And I, I think the world is in such a different place yeah. since the pandemic. Yeah. And I feel like people are hungry for connection, mm-hmm. for more goodness for more things that are real. And I write a lot with my, on my Instagram and Facebook and along with the cookie posts and cakes, I write from my heart and encouragement. And I've realized that that resonates more with people yeah. than almost anything else coming mm-hmm. out of this time. And, and it, I think it's just, it's caused people to slow down and, and look at things differently. And, and maybe that's a part of the change <laughs> yeah. and why it's working a little differently this time. Yeah. But I'm just, I'm really grateful and humbled for the opportunity and the support from the community. It's just, it's been an amazing journey so far. Nice. Very cool. So when you were starting it in 2017, was this just like a, like going to be like a side hobby that you did on the side? Pretty much, I think. Okay. You know, in my, I'm a big dreamer and I always set massive goals for myself. So I, you know, my goal is always to have some big business or company somewhere, (laughs) but I went, well, it's just something I'm going to dip you know, put my feet in the water, dip my toes in and just try. But yeah, I I figured it was just a little bit more of a hobby. And I, but I could feel like it just, it, I knew the timing wasn't right. You know, those gut feelings that you get. Yeah. And so I pretty much just let it sit for quite a few years. Okay. So when you decided that you were going to restart this and give it another go, um, what was kind of your steps? What did, what was your plan there? Oh goodness. I don't know if I had a plan. <laughs> I, I, I do now have about a 50 point list of what I thought the steps should be. And I just kind of check them off one at a time, getting all the social media um, out there and accomplished. And I, but I honestly didn't know where to start. It was just one post at a time. It was one picture of cookies at a time. And I found it kind of within a couple of months, it sort of took on a life of its own. And mm-hmm. I feel like, with where, what people have ordered and the comments I've gotten back and the feedback and the opportunities that have come my way, it's kind of taken on a life of its own and shown me where it wants to go. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things. I, I, I have a business plan, but I don't really feel in control of it. Okay. Which is an interesting experience because <laughs> I'm used to being, I'm a very organized person and I'm learning with this to just enjoy the ride yeah, and the blessings as they come and the opportunities and just go, I don't know where it's headed. I know where my big out here dreams are. You know, I was the kid that I remember being 10 years old and making sketches of skyscrapers with my business name on it. Cause that's the way I thought, mm-hmm. <laughs> but where Camino cookies is going, I don't know yet, but I, you know, I feel like there could be a lot of room for movement. Yeah. Um, but I'm just, my heart from the beginning has, has been to start to just foster community yeah, and, and encouragement within the community around me and really focus starting in Camino Island and Stanwood. Yeah. Very cool. So upon getting restarted, what were the first, like what, what, uh, how did you come up with your first designs and decide that like, okay, I'm ready to launch. I'm going to have, you know, make these types of cookies. Or I'd like to tell you, I put a lot of thought into it. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. Um, my creative brain tends to, I'll have all, I think in abstracts, I don't think in concrete. So I have all these abstract things that aren't fully realized. And sometimes I feel like a week before I need it, the picture's just there. Yeah. So I'd love to tell you it's some elaborate plan and it's really not. (laughs) (laughs) I I work best under pressure. So it seems like the last minute it's just, there it is. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go with that. Nice. So when you launched your first round then, did you just throw that up on your Facebook, your social media? It was Facebook and Instagram. I didn't have a website yet. It was just throwing it into the dark. I didn't know what happened, what happened. And I think from adding the right hashtags onto Instagram posts, it helped more people find me. Mm -hmm. Um, And honestly, it's just gone from there. I haven't advertised. It's just been word of mouth. Um, 
my best advertisement is people that have tried one cookie and tell several more. Yeah. Um, and send people that way. I have not been promoting at all. I think that's what's been amazing to me, other than just posting on Instagram and Facebook religiously. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, so what? when did you actually restart? I know you said in 2020. Like, what, mm-hmm. what part of it was it? It was December of 2020. Okay. So I'm coming up on a year. Nice. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Um, so you were... You launched the first one, and th- I'm assuming, like, so did you sell out, or what was kind of the... You know, it was it was kind of a trickle. I think it was March of 2021 where it finally took off. Okay. And I had a couple people reach out to me about baking for fundraisers, and those things fell through, but I had these designs, so I just posted them anyway, and what I found is that people just went, I'll take it, I'll take it, I'll take it, and it just flew out the door. Yeah. And... That was the point where I went, okay, I need to have a month ahead more of a plan, whether it's for pre-orders or pre-sales, where I have a box or a set that I sell. Um, And I'm finding that those are selling out every time. (laughs) Nice. Um, uh, Also, real quick, what type of, like, do you do all sorts of cookies or do you primarily focus on certain ones? You know, I've got a pretty healthy menu at the moment that I'm always adding to. Um, As far as custom orders, I get requests for royal iced cookies more than anything else. (laughs) So it's a lot of custom orders on my plate. It's busy, but I also have a lot of bakery items. So my, there are my own recipes of, um, chocolate chip cookies and things like chocolate dip, shortbread, ganache filled cookies. So my brain, I always kind of have a bit of, bit of a French patisserie in mind when I'm baking, but I have a lot of really good classics that everybody loves. Yeah. Very cool. Um, what are some of your favorite designs or, or, favorite cookies that you've kind of put together and what were kind of the inspiration behind them? Goodness. I think one of my recent favorites are a set of flowers that I did, um, for a friend's birthday. They were, um, purples and oranges. And I'd love to tell you there was some big inspiration. There really wasn't. I'm a less is more person. And I think when someone gives me the creative freedom to just do what I feel, Mm -hmm. I just find that it, It's just there. I love really simple things that harmonize well and aren't over embellished. Mm -hmm. Those are my favorite things. And it just kind of (laughs) happens. Yeah. Nice. The, uh, going through your Instagram and stuff, preparing for the podcast. Um, I loved the, like the note ones that you did or the little notepad with the little scribbles. Those were so popular. That (laughs) one surprised me. And I cannot claim any credit for that design. Um, so many people have done that before. Yeah. Um, what I didn't know is that it would be that popular. I sold out and then got custom order requests besides. So that one really, that surprised me. I can't usually call what will sell. Yeah. It's usually the thing that I don't expect and it just flies out the door. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's neat. And like, they're so like, if you ever, if you guys check out her Instagram, uh, it's at Camino cookies, right? Yes. At Camino cookies. Um, just if you scroll down through there, there's just some really amazing, like it's like art on a cookie and it's Thank you. great. It's, it's really fun to see. And then, um, you know, going through them, I was like, Oh, they're so nice. Like, but I also really want to bite into it. Cause like the frosting looks really, really good. <laughs> the biggest comment I get from people is I can't eat this. And I'm like, please do. There will be a hundred more where those came from. <laughs> nice. So as we're getting into like right now, we're in, uh, October, mm-hmm. uh, as we get into October, November, December, what are, are you guys, are you planning on doing some open pre-orders for very specific like holiday boxes and stuff? I am right now. I'm currently in my October cookie box season. So I still have half of my boxes available. Um, I sell out pretty quickly, but that's still open if anybody's listening and wants one, but, um, I'm still in the planning phase for November and December, but I will have cookie boxes for each of, um, the holidays upcoming. So Thanksgiving and Christmas. Okay. So they usually include about 14 to 17 cookies. Um, usually about four different varieties. Okay. And they're always themed for the holidays and they've been really popular this year. Nice. And then do you, um, as far as like, uh, actually getting them out there, do people pick them up? Do you ship them, deliver them? I'm not able to ship at the moment um, due to state regulations, but um, people pick them up straight from my home. Mm. So when someone orders, I will give them my address and my phone number. I don't put it out publicly. Right. 
But as soon as they order, I get that information out to them. And, you know, if someone's coming from further away than San Juan Camino, yep. occasionally I will meet them at a midpoint. Okay. And I, with large cake orders, I do deliver. Okay. Nice. So, yeah, I guess that's another question. What are all the different things that Camino Cookies does besides cookies? So besides cookies, I do custom cupcakes and custom cakes. So I've done a lot of birthdays, family parties. I have my first wedding coming up this next year. Nice. That I'm baking for. Um, so pretty much anything. If yeah. you can think about it, I can do it. Um, cakes especially, I recommend giving me a lot of notice, especially now I've got about a four week lead time. I'm, I'm pretty booked. Yeah. And so I try to tell people, if you've got a really important event, event, um, birthdays, give me four weeks, weddings much longer because it <laughs> takes a lot of planning. Yeah. <laughs> I get some last minute requests and I actually love those and I'm happy to fit them in if I can. But typically I need several weeks at least for special events. Cakes yeah. take a lot of planning. Yes. Yeah, my wife, um, uh, prior to us owning the Marketplace, um, she started making um, little, like, she got really into cake baking and was doing it for, um, you know, like our kids' birthdays. And then, um, you know, some of her family was asking, oh, could you do the cake for my kid? Mm -hmm. Um, So she was doing that. And then she actually ended up doing a few different weddings of friends. And one of them was actually like a multi-tiered cake. And so she researched how to do it. You know, she was Good buying little her. things on the it's side. It's nerve-wracking. Yeah. Well, then, of course, she threatened me, um, you know, uh, uh, if I ever screwed up any of the things. Because she's <laughs> like, okay, now take this out to the car and don't let it touch it's anything. I'm anything. like, um, I don't know if I'm qualified for this job. <laughs> it, there's a lot of pressure. I My mom is my designated driver when I'm doing a cake delivery. And because I sit next to it and I hold it because it, it's there's a lot of money that people spend on those yes. items. and. You want to make sure it gets to the event safely. And it that part's not fun. I'm always relieved when I get it there and I'm like, okay, it got to the party. Everything's good. Yeah. No. And, and during this whole time, we had three under two, uh, three kids under two. So it was like, keep the kids away. I don't know how she sure did it. <laughs> I couldn't. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a, a very scary time of our lives. No doubt. <laughs> Stressful. So very cool. So um Nice. So you, you've got it all prepped out. And then as you move, um, I'm sure right now you're probably just in the planning phase of just getting through the holiday season. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you, now that you're like almost a year into it then, um, do you expect that come January, you're going to kind of reevaluate and plan out what you want to see for 2022? Yeah, I probably will. Um, depending on how my bookings go, I may have a couple weeks that I'm closed um, mm-hmm. at the first of the year just to take a break. Yeah. It's very physically demanding it. On Instagram, it looks glamorous. <laughs> it's really not. I have 14 to 16 hour days where I'm so exhausted, and but you just got to keep going. But yeah, I will, I will definitely need time at the beginning of the year to go, okay, where do I think it's headed from here? Mm-hmm. And yeah. Nice. Very cool. So what do you see as the future of Camino Cookies? If you had... I know the reason I want to ask it this way is because you've already mentioned that you like to dream big. So I do. like if you were to go to like a five and 10 year mark, what would be your current dream slash vision of where it could be or what it would look like? 10 years out, I would love to have a formal bakery somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, in my wildest dreams, I would love to have one here on Camino just because I love this place and yeah. the community so much. Um, but I would also <clears throat> love to have bakeries in larger markets like Bellevue or Seattle or even, um, in California somewhere. But those are really, really big dreams. Yeah. Um, and I know that dreams and plans can morph and change, but those are always things that I will inside, you know, I'll want. Yeah. Um, but it would be wonderful to have um, a brick and mortar eventually. You know, it's, yeah. it's very expensive, the overhead with that is yes. a lot. You know, you know, Brandon, all too well. <laughs> um, but it would be a really wonderful thing. It would require a lot more staff and a lot of training involved. But yeah, yeah, those are before then. It would be really wonderful to have more pop ups. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those are the big the big goals. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. <laughs> uh, currently, where do you think you are in the sense of like needing a like needing to hire or not? Oh my goodness! Um, if I do farmers markets this next year. I could need help one day a week. I'm at that point. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, it, it. I might be a couple years out before I yeah. really go, okay, I need to um, reorganize my business structure yep. and, and hire someone on. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. And 
I, I, uh, it was a couple podcasts ago now I was talking about this, but, um, I think what you just said was very important in the sense of like, you know, you're, you're already in this state where you're working, you know, 14, 16 yeah. hour days. <laughs> yeah. You're probably working seven days a week sometimes. Yes. Um, and even in that you are still saying, I'm still a couple years away from yeah. hiring someone. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, when I was doing some research, you know, before I, we, my wife and I purchased the marketplace, mm -hmm. um, we were looking, I was looking at different businesses to start and yeah. it was like in those things, I think <clears throat> a lot of people look at like, okay, so you get started and within six months and you're hiring somebody and you're moving on to this and, and it's like, no, it's <laughs> like a, it's a very long, you know, it's long not process. that long, but it's a process yeah, and you can't it shortcut it. No, you can't like, you need to go through those steps as you get you to do. that point. And you got to start by paying yourself. Yeah. And a lot of businesses fail in the first year. Right. I'm really grateful that I'm not, but I've got some business experience under my belt. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would go under if I hired someone or if I had, you know, a brick and mortar location. Yeah. So you have to, those baby steps, you have to go, okay, where do I begin? And then these are further out goals. Yeah. And because um, you, you don't want to go broke in the process. Right. And so many people do. Yeah. But like you said, yeah, it takes, it, it doesn't always go as fast as you like it. <laughs> right. Right. Um, um, from your experience of doing other business things to this, are there certain things that you think are um, important in opening and running a small business in a small community versus if you had just opened one up in Seattle or launched in Seattle? Um, small community. I think it's easier to connect with people. I, in my experience, um, I've done impersonal business where it's all online. You're selling to people in other countries. Mm -hmm. um, and that requires really having a product that a wide range of people are looking for yeah. and looking for at a certain price point. Um, what I'm doing here with Camino Cookies um, in a more rural community, I think relationships are the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Relationships are what sell it. Um, yeah. Really, it's not just having a quality product, but it's it's being, I think, a quality person in your community. Yeah. And really showing those around you that you're there, um, that you're supportive of what's going on around you, the people around you, mm -hmm. and really showing up consistently day after day. Yeah. And... Those relationships and relationships and connections, I think, are what really build. And that could be true anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, somewhere bigger like Seattle, it can be really impersonal. And I haven't had a lot of experience in that market. Um, I think it would, in that environment, it would be even more important to have your branding very, very much on point. Yeah. And know exactly what you're doing because you've got one shot to get it right or you'll go under. And that could be true here on Camino Island or in Stanwood. Yeah. Um, but I, I think no matter where you are, relationships are really important. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know what else to say other than that. Yeah. No, I, I think that is super important. And um, again, I was just talking to someone in, on another podcast about that, that, um, you know, the relationships that you have with your vendors with your, mm -hmm. the people, um, you know, we were talking about subcontractors because yeah. the, the people that we know in this community that, um, are willing to make that midnight call. Like we've had a plumber here at like, you know, eight o'clock, mm -hmm. nine o'clock way past. He was on another job and we are like, look, our, this restaurant is shut down because we can't open right yeah. now because yeah. this is, this issue is going on. And he had to drive, like he was already technically done for the day, drove all the way back to a shop to get the correct equipment he needed yeah, and then yeah. came out and like you just get that in that small community of the people versus you know, i've tried to call other plumbing companies or other electricians or whatever and they and won't do it yeah they're like well we can get you next week <laughs> like yeah. that doesn't work like this will be shut down for a week then. yeah yeah so, and that's challenging when you're a business yeah so i definitely think uh relationships with the people and in, in, yeah. in the community yeah. are, are extremely important they are sure. they are it's so. you wouldn't have a business without them right Without, you know, the people around you, the relationships that you make, you wouldn't. They're what make it go around. You've yeah. got to show up, but you're there for them ultimately. Right. Right. Very cool. All right. Well, I like to end every podcast with some rapid fire questions. Sure. So the first one is, what purchase of $100 or less have you enjoyed the most in the last three months? 
all my flowers, my bulbs, my plants. <laughs> I've spent quite a bit of money on my garden. Nice. Very cool. Getting all prepped for next year? I am, yeah, because I'll be selling flowers as well next year. Okay, nice. All right. Hopefully you'll come to the uh, Camino Farmer's Market too. Oh, that would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, pretend you have a friend coming from out of town. What would the first day look like here? Oh, goodness. I've had more than one friend come up. It's always the same. I bring them to the marketplace um, for coffee and French pastry. And then we go make a tour of the beaches and the trails. And it's always nature and coffee. And <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right. Who is an interesting or fascinating person in this community that I should interview next? The only person that comes to mind is Brenna Estrada. And oh, she's yes. done some of the farmer's markets here. Yes. She's a local flower farmer here on yep. Camino Island. And she's also involved with the Happy Hollow Farms yes. markets there. Yep. And she's a really, really great quality person. Yes. Yeah, I got to have her on the podcast. Um, I met her through the farmer's market Okay, here. okay. Um, but what was funny with her was that I, um, once we found out she was coming to the market and stuff, um, my wife had let me know, like, oh, there's this, you know, uh, florist that I follow on Kamena yeah, that yeah. does like these beautiful bouquets and everything. She does. And um, I was like, oh, she's coming to our farmer's market now. Um, but I mean, I was, I'm not a flower person. By <laughs> That's any okay. Of my <laughs> but when, when she started coming, um, I started like, I looked at her bouquets and stuff. They had flowers I'd mm -hmm. never seen before. Yeah, um, yeah. The arrangements were just amazing. They're I was beautiful. Like, yeah. She does was, an incredible job. I was job. blown away by that. So um, yeah, she's a, she's a great person. She is. Sure. All right. Um, and finally, what piece of advice would you give your 20-year-old self? That's actually kind of a tough one. Um, I think I would just tell that girl, life's going to be harder than you ever pictured, but don't give up. No matter what, just don't give up. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast thank today. Thank you, Brandon. It's been an honor to be here. All right. And Islanders, I will talk to you on the next one. Well, a big thank you to Elise Lean for joining me on the podcast today, and thank you for listening. If you haven't already, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. It really helps us be found by other islanders like yourself. And for more information on this episode, you can go to commandocommons.com slash podcast. That's commandocommons.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening and see you next time.